So now we're going to open it up to the quest to questions from the audience. I'm going to bring you a microphone to speak into, so you won't have to yell. So just raise your hand, and I will come running. Um, um, so you've talked an awful lot about collaboration and an awful lot about the use of technology. And when I look at student B, at least the first three, and probably creative and innovative two, also require a level of focus. And I know as an architectural profession, which I'm part of, we tend, when we see a problem, to swing the pendulum all the way in the other direction. So the, we, there is a lot of focus on collaboration today, and we're doing that better than we did 10 years ago, or even five. But where is the focus in all of this? And Regina, I'm especially interested in, in you know, those, the students with the special needs, a large part of of that a lot of times is not being able to isolate when there's so much going on to get to the one piece that you need to focus on. So I'm curious, Ken, I guess, first of all, where you see the idea of the focused learning in the context of all this, and then, uh, Regina, specifically how you're addressing it here. Okay. Um, so I would say that critical thinking and problem solving are the first among equals here because these sets of skills get a bad rap. They get referred to as soft skills. Um, they're not soft skills. Critical thinking and problem solving are harder than memorization. And so um, I, most districts that we're working with lead with improving pedagogy around critical thinking and problem solving. Now some of that, not all of it, is in a collaborative environment like teams working on problems, but some of it are individual problems that are are more applied learning and more problem-solving learning. And so I think it's a combination. But look, I, 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 I appreciate your point that we spend a lot on collaboration. But parents in schools in New Jersey are fighting collaboration. And every employer in New Jersey wants collaborative workers. So you've got a, and because the rap is, which is ridiculous, the rap is, is if I allow a collaborative working environment in my school, my kid's grade's going to go down and they won't get into Harvard because Janie didn't do her part of the teamwork that night. That's what's going on. That's when I go to high-performing districts, the parents don't want collaboration because the kids can't get into an Ivy League school, which is crazy. But every employer in New Jersey knows that we're getting kids coming out of K through 12 schools and four-year institutions that are not able to work in, your, in, the high, high, in the highly collaborative environments of every company in the room. Steelcase, right? All of you guys. You, you now, there's no work being done by anybody by themselves. So I would just say to you, right now, we're getting 95% still focus in most districts on, on, on memorization and student A model. And the reason I think we're all spending so much time trying to head the other way is, is if we don't get rid of the rows of chairs, we're never going to have a pedagogical environment in which we can really teach kids critical thinking and problem solving, whether it's individually or in teams. And I, I think that when you talk about the focus, the focus isn't on the answer anymore. The focus is on the process. So. I mean, you can look at the park assessment. It's not about getting the right answer anymore. It's about how did you come to that? How did you think about that? So even in our environment, six to seven years ago, we instituted a project adventure learning. People may know that as ropes courses and things along those lines. But we didn't do it that way. We don't, we don't have that particular part. We did it as a team building activity. So, I, I mean, I, in, in another point of my life, worked in corporate America, and that was like the biggest thing you did was team building activities. It's really how to connect people and how to bond and things along those lines. So we created that for our kids, and I'm gonna tell you, the first three years, it was the most stressful part of our teachers' month. We only did it four times a year, then we started doing it once a month. Our teachers were like panicked. Because our teachers, at that point, were all about control. You're sitting in your desk, I have to make up compliance. And it's, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, the behaviors may have been that for some of our kids, that we needed that first. Um, but now that is not the case. So the, those team building days are not as stressful and we let kids argue it out, which is unheard of in schools. We let them argue, we let the kid walk off to the side and we do not intervene. Um, and then they have to work to get that group back together. 
it is more important than them learning um, their times tables, you know, or anything along those lines, because that skill will help them be able to work with other people. And it's, you know, the other stuff will come, but those skills are much harder to teach. So we have to set that up in an, a safe environment for them. Um, uh, one question, but first a comment. I heard an interesting thing, if I caught it right on the news this morning, I was trying to race out of my hotel, but to your point about, you know, changing the model so that, you know, how does that affect my student getting into college, the right college? I think I heard today that schools like Wake Forest, for example, effective now do not require students to submit an SAT score. And the reaction was kind of what, you know, what you just said is, what? How are you going to know if I'm smart enough? And they're looking for a totally different thing and a totally different profile. So I thought that was a step in the right direction from a school like Wake Forest. So we've talked a lot. First of all, this is a really special place that Regina's, you know, uh, put together here. So I, you're to be commended for the work you do. Um, you know, if you go up to a high school with 2,000 students, I'm guessing the challenges are a little different. And how do you move kind of that middle core of, you know, students that were, you know, kind of like me to sort of figure out how do you, you know, get through the semester and get good grades and move on without having to do a whole lot of work. But I'm particularly interested in your thinking then about how does this apply into higher education? We didn't really talk about that much today, where, you know, there's a whole nother set of challenges of, of moving the needle. Because companies like the one I work for are looking for, you know, college graduates. I don't think you need to graduate to be part of this college anymore to go to be part of this discussion. But how do you think this translates into, into higher education? I'm curious of the thought you know, both from an architectural point of view as to what's changing and then also from the, um, you know, Ken, from your observations about what's happening. Uh, I have to think about it a little bit. I don't, I do more of the primary and secondary than, uh, than higher ed. I do occasionally. Um, I mean, I think um, at the university level, the students are much more mobile. So, you know, the blended kind of spaces, we see that a lot more. So if we're doing a dorm, there's classrooms in the dorm, there's, you know, there's all kinds of mixed, you know, I think that the idea that they go to the library, we didn't talk about libraries at all, but <laughs> I, people always ask us architects about libraries, you know, what's going on, like this is your Tell library. us about the libraries. <laughs> well, I, I just think the li I personally think the library is a fantastic 21st century learning space. I just always say it's just not a container of books anymore. That's the only difference. Everything else is fantastic about a library. Um, you know, it has a variety of spaces, has a ton of technology, and has somebody to guide you. And that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I've always found that they're like the big binder of the community. Queens Library is one of our customers. And I've seen people line up three blocks in 100 degree weather to wait to get into the library. Yes, air conditioning. But they all come there and they collect, and everyone of different races, creeds, ages, everyone coming there to talk, to discuss, to, to share cultural ideas. It's no longer now about books because you can go to the internet, you can get, download books that you want or whatnot and get exposure. But there seems to be a large exchange of ideas that I'm finding. And it seems to be rare to have a community center where you can collaborate as a community and share those ideas. And I find that especially uh, the libraries tend to be changing into that. Regina and Ken, do you have any comments about the connection to higher ed? No, I, I think, I, mean, I, can, I can speak to our student. Um, I think what we really look to do is prepare them for higher ed, to prepare them for the kind of the hangout spaces in college and where they should go and the student centers and, and going, it, it, the, the library to me is a very social right. spot now. Um, and how to really collaborate and, and, and meet people. Um, I think that, um, you know, just from my own experience with Steelcase and the Node Chair, the initial, when we first were introduced to Steelcase, most of the, the work was done in higher ed. So we were really looking at um, bringing that down to the, our level, if you will, not in a negative. Um, so we were really looking at spaces that were designed for the higher ed and for that type of learning. Um, and I think that, um, Depending on what college you, you walk into, so many colleges have designed, if you go into the food court at the college that I went to, I can't even believe it. I wish I was there now. Um, but, but some of their dormitories and some of the other spaces, have, I might as well still be there now. You know? So they've taken on some things, but not everything. But I think what, yeah. what we have seen um, is there is a method to their madness about why the food court looks mm -hmm. so 
you know, inviting and, uh, and why they're, you know, Barnes and Noble takes over your bookstore and stuff like that. Because I think at the university level, they find they have to draw them out. They want them to communicate with each other. Otherwise, because of technology, they could yeah. just wind up doing everything from their room. They can access the library from there, you know, and, and everything. So we do see that need for commons to, to mm -hmm. have that social uh, and interactive collaboration happen. Ken? So I, I didn't, neither of us mentioned that my background is I'm a recovering attorney by training. And um, <laughs> so I come to education late. I didn't really get to education until 96. It is totally counterintuitive to me that I have discovered that the lower down the teacher is in the K-20 chain, the more receptive they are to student B. So if I walk in and I talk to elementary students, school teachers and I say that's what we're looking at they'll go you know we're in the business of trying to figure out what our kids need and we actually do some of that not all of it but that looks open. and if you're telling us that's what the kids really need tell us how to do it and we're open to it by the time maybe some of that in middle school not much by the time you get to high school and then by the time you get to higher ed totally the educators persona is wrapped up in their I, personal identification with the student A model. They're all there because they're experts in math, science, English, and social studies. Try walking into a higher ed institution at this point and ask them what they're doing about critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. It's not happening. And if you ask educators, educators, uh, employers, employers have been telling us now for 12 years consistently we can teach people the discipline. We can teach them the content. We can't teach them how to collaborate. We can't teach them how to effectively communicate at this point. And there are employers that have actually removed themselves from recruiting in PhD programs because the PhD programs weren't collaborative in nature. There were single isolated researchers and they said to them, we're not recruiting from here anymore because we don't have any research done that way. So, uh, so one last point I want to make about your, your earlier point, because I don't want you to leave the impression that this is all about being done at a small scale. So I don't think being here at a great example of this work means that it can't be done at scale. We have districts that are committed to doing this work at 60,000 students, Virginia Beach, Virginia, um, uh, Douglas County, Colorado. I, if you guys want to go visit we can go visit small schools that are doing it, but if you want to go visit public school districts that are committed at scale to doing this work, they're there and working with us. So I, I don't think this is just about an environment of 125. I think it's a leadership vision issue, and there are leaders in this country of huge districts. Fairfax County is on this journey at 180,000 students in Virginia. So I don't think it's just about size. I think, I think it's about vision and leadership. Ken, actually, you stole my, my question because um, as an architect, I've been doing schools for about 30 years. I've been staring at this student B and student A all night. And one of my greatest joys is to walk down a lower school or, or K, to, K to three grade levels and watch those kids do everything that's in a student B and yet go to a high school and see those kids falling asleep and slouched in their chair. So what has happened in our education system between the lower grades and the upper grades where we really steal that from, from the kids and force them into the student A mold. Is it, is it you know, I, I think we've talked about that. It's the testing, it's the, it's the, it's the, the uh, what they're being taught, it's how they're being taught. Uh, as an architect, you know, we, the, the difference is that learning takes place every place nowadays. It's not just in the box in the, in the, uh, in the classroom, but I think, you know, it's a shame that we take those little kids that, that do collaborate on the floor and, and work with each other and turn them into to student A's of, along the way. So it's a minor question, which is, what has happened to our educational system? <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna answer just one thing on that, too, is that, because um, I totally agree with you, and I, I think just coming from the education background, what's really hard is to give teachers time to plan. Okay, so if, if I could, uh, you know, change the world, um, I would have teachers work 12 months and I'd pay them that way. 
Um, I would be out of uh, kids going to school and having this two month break at the summertime. Um, we don't, we don't, our kids don't farm anymore. We don't do that anymore. I would look at us really, um, really having, you know, we, we would go to quarters and maybe there's two weeks off, you know, and then you come back for another quarter and you're going to school year round. Um, and everyone will still get their vacation time. And then there's set times where teachers are truly just planning. Because being a, a teacher, it's really hard to be with your kids all day long because you're on point all day long. And then to have your brain shift to be able to do planning and then calling parents and doing all these other things that you really have to do um, where you really need some good focus time, if you will. So I think one of the... The, the things that we don't do well is give teachers time to plan. Um, and I think if we had year-round schooling that way, we would be able to do that more. Um, it would change the, the world because it would change summer camp. It would change everything. It would change sports. I would go to school longer. Those are things that I think that we could do eventually. Um, but in years to come, because we should treat educa education, we're in the business of educating kids. So still cases in the business of selling furniture. We're, we really have to keep similar models and, and, and really um, have teachers work a longer day, longer hours. And I think teachers would be appreciative of it if that's how everything else was structured. But that's my own, per, it's my own I'm, I'm sorry you asked that question because it's a personal thing for me on that. <laughs> so one, I, in the last, answer to the last question, I think I answered part of this, which is the way we train high school and college teachers is very different than the way we train elementary school teachers. And so I don't want to be too hard on them. They grew up being told that their job in life was to teach their content discipline. So I think that one reason is, is K through five educators are not told to teach a content discipline. They're teaching four or five subjects in an interdisciplinary environment. And they're told that there's a lot of developmental issues they've got to own during that period, and so that's what they've been trained to do. But I want you to look at longitudinally uh, differently, which is in the 50s and 60s, we were effectively training the whole spectrum for cut scores, for content mastery, for discipline, for loyalty, for work ethic, and we did a pretty good job. We did a pretty good job. Those were the jobs we, requirements that we needed, and, and they, we, the, 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 those periods of manufacturing, um, we were well served during that period. So now we hit an innovation knowledge economy, and most of those are in low order need, and the things that are required are applied learning. We weren't teaching it. You know, people get, get all mashed up. We're, our cut scores globally are bad because we don't do well on applied learning. We've never been teaching it. So let's not beat ourselves up too much. We never went around saying we had to have applied learning. Now the Common Core has applied learning in it. But you know, we, ne we have not made that shift. So I guess what I would say is, is that the message for me in all this is that as architects and school leaders, this shift to the knowledge economy, this shift to creation and innovation economy, that's a shift that you all can help with with your clients. But as we started the night, we said all the constituencies need to help in being brought along because they're stuck in the model they know, and that's where that's why we're having the trouble. And it ultimately will have to will rectify itself because that's where all the work's going to be. That's where all the jobs are going to be. So it'll happen. Is this question is is whether educators are going to go into this fighting or whether educators will have you know partners like this where they're working with an architect and a design firm and a technology, all of whom want to help support the model. When that happens, look what you get. It's pretty cool. Any other questions? I think that's a great place to end. I want to thank you all for attending, and I'm going to pass it over to my good friend Kevin thank for you. his closing remarks. So I guess my question to everybody is, I'm ready to go back to school, right? So I'll, I want to be student B. I know, I know I was student A. So the other thing I'll share is that I have two freshmen, one in high school and one in college, and I can't wait to go home and have the conversation with them to figure out, especially the college student that's costing me a lot of money. Let's understand how we're learning, okay? So this concludes tonight. I want to say, first of all, thank you all for coming. You guys took a lot, lot of time out of your day. 
and it's really we're, we're really appreciative you that that you did that for us I'd like to thank all of our panelists here Mark Call Regina and Ken for doing such a great job I hope you found everything informative I saw a lot of note-taking you were either getting your work done or you were taking some really good notes that'll hopefully make us all better tomorrow and Chris what a great job you did also and on behalf of Steelcase and DSD, thank you. <laughs>